Um, and what I will ask is as we go and you have questions, um, please jump off mute. Um, you can also use the chat, of course, as well, if you like, and I'll pay attention and keep an eye on that as well. Um, but we're gonna go ahead and dive right in. Um, Justin, I'll have you pull off mute, introduce yourself. Um, and I'm gonna be driving a lot of the questions here initially, but hopefully other folks will jump in with questions as well. And we'll, we'll kind of set the stage. So um, intro on who you are and who WeFunder is. Cool, nice to meet you all. Uh, my name's Justin, I'm in San Diego. I'm actually also in North Park. So uh, always trying to connect with the homies in Southern California. I'm originally from LA. Um, I actually started my career at a nonprofit called Kiva. Kiva was doing five to $10,000 zero percent interest microloans for entrepreneurs all over. Uh, it's really a global nonprofit. I led the US team at Kiva. So I was going around the country kind of growing uh, Kiva's programs in cities all across the country. Um, that inspired me to start my own business. I moved to San Diego in 2017 to start my own boat charter company. So I have a party cruise uh, business in San Diego Bay. I have two boats in San Diego Bay, two boats in Mission Bay, and I do like party cruises. Um, did that full time in 2017, 2018. And then eventually made my way back to we, uh, uh, back to my core team at Kiva, who had then moved on to WeFunder. So when I went to go start the boat business, they had moved on to WeFunder, and uh, they kind of recruited me back into the mix. That was about two years ago. Um, WeFunder is growing really, really fast. Equity crowdfunding as an industry is growing really, really fast. I think that generally speaking, raising capital is really hard. Uh, it's been, it's just a challenge for entrepreneurs to get the capital they need to grow. Uh, and I think at the highest kind of baseline, it's like WeFunder makes it easier and faster for founders to be able to raise capital. Um, Perfect. So let's, let's pause there and just back up again here real quick. Thank you, Justin, for the intro. Um, what made equity crowdfunding possible. Talk a bit about the legislation and kind of the background around that, if you would. Yeah, so uh, in 2017, uh, as part of the Jobs Act, uh, I believe, yeah, I think it was 2017 when the law officially went into action, which basically said unaccredited investors can invest in private companies. Uh, that was the that was the kind of core law that shifted in 2017, um, but equity crowdfunding really didn't take off uh, as a byproduct of the cap table. So when that law went into effect, any private investor, or, you know, any investor would go on the cap table. So the kind of ethos. And, and I want to pause there just in case, folks, um, just to kind of you know, unpack some of the words that we're using, uh, capitalization table is what? Uh, that sh that's a list of people who have invested in the company. Awesome. And the issue prior, uh, I'll just give a, by way of an example, a friend of mine who long time ago back, about 15 years ago, started a brewery uh, here in San Diego. And it was around, uh, it was called Firehouse Brewery. And they had 75 investors in the company, individual investors, um, different firemen from around the country. And so they had 75 people on their cap table, basically, right? 75 different investors that they had to, to, to really list out, so to speak. And equity crowdfunding, you kind of roll those unaccredited investors into one line item. As I'm, am I understanding that correctly? Is that how that works? Yeah, so that was the inflection point of the industry when uh, we basically were able to pool investors into an SPV. That's a special purpose vehicle. That's basically, you have a lot of investors that are all investing under the same terms and they're packaged under one lead investor that ends up on your cap table. And that was the inflection point that really created like explosive growth in the equity crowdfunding industry. And was probably the single biggest driver of our business was the construction of the cap table and how that worked. Got it, makes sense. Um, so, and again, chime in please. Um, if you have questions, anything that Justin's saying that, that I don't 
you know, pause to clarify, please, please, please ask. So please jump in. And again, I'll uh, pop the chat open here. Um, perfect, Ginger. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and make sure I'm paying attention to that as well. So, um, okay, so we, we 2017, the Jobs Act paves the way. Um, prior to this, uh, really define an accredited investor for us so we kind of understand the difference, if you would. A uh, what? An, an, an accredited investor. Like why the, you know, why is this such a big deal? Well, the vast majority of people in the country are unaccredited investors. Um, for, you know, there's, there's a complex equation by which the government identifies what an accredited investor is, but at the highest level, it's just a rich person that <laughs> call it a million dollars of net worth, you know, like something like that. Yeah. Um, Isn't it like a certain amount net worth and a certain amount liquid? Yes. Yeah. yeah. There, there, there's like a, there's like a complex equation on, you know, like how you determine accreditation, but the vast majority of the people in the country are not accredited. So uh, this basically said, hey, we're going to open it up for anybody to invest in the private markets uh, and be able to buy a stake in private companies all over the country. Um, you know, it's just there. It's just a massive, massive opportunity from a, a capital reserve standpoint to say, like, okay, like, you know, a lot of companies when they go raise their you know seed round, they might have a twenty five thousand dollar minimum for accredited investors to be able to participate. Now we're basically saying, hey, the minimum's a hundred dollars, and it's available to anybody. So. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that you can look at something like that. One could be, hey, instead of, you know, let's say an investor says no at 25,000 and you can get them in at one or 5,000. That's a huge opportunity to be able to say yes to anybody who might have said no because there was a certain, uh, a certain floor on, on the possible investment that they're coming with. Another is, hey, maybe, you know, like, hey, now I can go legitimately take money from friends and family. Uh, that, is, that is a very traditional way by which founders raise capital. And I can accept all of them. And there's investment contracts. It's totally legit. It's compliant. It's, it's kind of approved by the SEC. Everything is, everything is clean to be able to, to accept money from any friends and family. The third is, hey, maybe you're a consumer facing brand and you've got a lot of customers and you've got a lot of people that you're engaged with and you're building community. You know, you look at the example of a brewery. Um, in San Diego, I worked very closely with a brewery called Amplified Ale Works. Border X Brewing uh, did a raise with us. Modern Times did a ra raise with us. We've had a lot of success with breweries because they're community businesses. So you walk into Amplified Ale Works, they've got little table tents at all their tables. They've got little business cards that go with all the receipts. They've got posters on the wall. And they're basically saying like, hey, be a part of what we're building here. Yeah. Um, so being able to kind of extend the opportunity to invest to a broader community uh, has wide ranging implications, especially for consumer facing brands that have a lot of interaction with, uh, with the general populace. Absolutely. And, and as you said, it's like, be part of the story, you know, be, and be one of the insiders, so to speak, on the business. Um, and Justin, talk about the benefits of going with uh, this model, uh, again, as opposed to going out to your friends and family and, you know, having all these little investors. How do future investors look at this? Again, one light, on, one light item on your cap table, versus, you know, all these people, how did they value that as the business grows and scales and maybe exits? Well, it's kind of like if you raise from institutional investors, they generally are kind of um, praised for connections, expertise, resources that they may be able to tap you into. Uh, this is just a different flavor of value where it's like, oh, well, if I can get 200 people to invest in my company, there's huge upside in that as well. There's an army, there's a base, there's a foundation, there's a stakeholder group that adds a lot of value to the business and it can be applied in really creative ways. So I think it's a, it's a different value proposition to raise from the crowd. Uh, I think it's equally valid as you know the other end of the spectrum. It's just a different mix of pros and cons. Um, 
I think that in terms of fo follow on financing and going from seed to series A to series B, if you're going through that traditional kind of financing track, um, the cleanness of the cap table is relevant and important. And the one line makes it very, very friendly and clean for follow on investors, where if you go to them and give them your cap table and there's hundreds of lines on it with hundred dollar investors, that's a turnoff. Now you go with one line, it doesn't even say we funder, it's not even explicit that you did an equity crowdfunding campaign. It's just a much cleaner look uh, you know, to those follow on investors. With that said, there's still a stigma, no doubt, where it's like, oh, you couldn't do, you know, like you couldn't fundraise in the right in the in the traditional way. You're not legit, you know. Um, there's certainly like there's certainly a stigma to a certain extent attached to equity crowdfunding, but I think that especially over the past year, with the explosive growth of the industry and really good companies choosing this pathway. Uh, and and kind of owning it and and kind of approaching it with confidence. Uh, you're cer I'm certainly seeing like massive kind of shifts in the in the industry around uh, kind of the acceptance and appeal of equity crowdfunding, how it can add value, why it's good for entrepreneurs. You're seeing a lot of movement there, which is awesome. Um, we're we're really bullish that you know at the end of the day, founders are going to go with solutions that make fundraising easier and faster. And uh, I feel very confidently that, you know, equity crowdfunding does that generally. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Yeah. I, I just wanted to clarify that because I have heard this a lot and we can give Nicole McDonald as an example here. Right. Um, Virginia asked a question. I know Jen, you've got lots of questions. So definitely this is, this is what this is for. Um, let's show a few examples. Cause I think, especially for somebody maybe like Cami, who's like, okay, I'm totally new to this. I need a little bit of <laughs> framework. Um, Justin, I made you co-host. If you want to screen share and maybe pull up a few projects. I know Virginia asked about Trust Me Vodka. I don't know if they happen to be on the, the WeFunder platform or not, but let's definitely show Nicole's uh, raise and maybe talk about her as a case study a little bit. Sure. So while you're pulling that up, for those of you who don't know, Nicole McDonald, she is a longtime Hera Hub member. Um, she has a crossbody handbag she invented called the Sash Bag. She had raised money previously from a, from a, a, a handful of individuals, um, but also some angel investors and even uh, like Sylvia Ma has invested uh, in Nicole, but also through Sylvia's um, uh, through Ad Astra Ventures with Allison Long Patine, who is a venture capitalist, frankly. I mean, she does typically a lot of bigger deals. Sylvia brought in Vidya um, and Allison on to investing in Nicole. And they, my understanding, Justin, is, you know, this was, and this happens a lot of times. I see this where, you know, an investor will say, you know, Hey, if you can go do this and show me that you're you have these ra raving fans, which Nicole does, I'll then invest additional money into this, right? It like kind of proves to them a bit like kind of traditional crowdfunding, which is more product based, which, which Nicole has done. I mean, she's raised well over a million dollars on Kickstarter pre selling handbags, but this is different, right? She's not selling handbags through this. She's selling a piece of her business, ownership in her business. So talk, if you don't mind, a little bit about, about this particular project. Yeah, so uh, this is a really good example of kind of how a consumer-facing brand can leverage their community. Uh, she's obviously built a very strong community. There's a lot of people passionate about these bags. I showed up to one of her webinars and it was like, holy shit, there's a, over 100 people here. This is nuts. Um, you know, basically, you know, to your point earlier, she's not selling handbags. She's basically selling equity in her company. She's saying our company is worth $10 million and then you can buy equity, you know, based on, you know, a safe and all the details are in the safe, uh, which you can look at here. Brian Smith is her lead investor. Brian Smith is the former founder of UGG. Uh, so, 
all of the investments from the 300 plus investors that she's brought to the platform that have been vested, not just 300 people from her community, but also uh, many new investors from our community that have come and participated in her raise. It's kind of a, it, it's a mix of investors from her network, investors from WeFunders network kind of coming together. Uh, all of those investors are purchasing equity at the $10 million cap on the safe. Uh, and being funneled and represented by Brian, who's the lead investor on the round. What I think uh, is- Can you define a safe for us, Justin? Uh, a safe is very similar to a convertible note. It is a very common uh, kind of mechanism by which founders are able to offer equity in their company um, uh, without saying, you know, without putting a, a firm price on it. Generally, when you go raise your Series A from institutional investors, uh, you've gotten the business to a, to a certain point where it can be it can be priced by professionals. Uh, this is kind of a uh, halfway house to say like, eh, we're not quite there yet, but this is you know you can still you can still buy a piece of the puzzle as we kind of work our way to institutional investors down the line. Got it. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. Um. So. What I think is most compelling about, maybe not most compelling, but a really compelling aspect of WeFunder is it's a very dynamic presentation of the business where you've got a three minute pitch video kind of talking about what you're, what you're building. And then here she has the opportunity to be like, hey, we've, we've generated 14 million in revenue. Uh, this is why we're raising capital. This is what our community looks like. This is our lead investor. So it's a really kind of like point, it's a very punchy way to basically be like, here are all the different pieces of this business that make it interesting to invest. So she's selling the business. It's, it's kind of similar to a pitch deck. It's just formatted in a, in a slightly more dynamic way where you've got the pitch video, you've got a couple quick bullet points, you've got the team, and then you've got kind of more a long form kind of story to tell, which includes, you know, videos, you know, this is a video that she uh, that she developed earlier in the life of the business that she can highlight. So it's kind of mixed media. Uh, you've got, uh, <laughs> you know, you've got cool ways to story tell here in a very kind of robust in a very robust way. Uh, you've got a link to the pitch deck. You've got updates on the business. So here, these are kind of things that are happen happening with, uh, you know, with the company and the raise. Here, she's talking about short-term debt and what her numbers look like and how this actually works. Um, so it's a it's a nice way to kind of story tell and give kind of in the moment updates on the business. What's happening today? What are questions that are being asked? This is an open forum for Q and A, uh, so any investors can come and ask questions and, and engage directly with Nicole. So, from a um, presentation and engagement standpoint, it's far more dynamic than just a static pitch deck that gives a very like narrow picture of the business at any given point in time. Here, it's like we have we have video, we have text, we have. Uh, an open forum Q and A. We have weekly updates about the business. We have different we have different assets that are kind of sprinkled and give a more dynamic presentation of what this business is, why it's an interesting investment, and then it gives anybody the opportunity uh, to invest. So um, this is kind of yeah, and you know you go here. You know, there's literally two, you know, 266 companies that all, you know, that all have that opportunity, you know, that opportunity to tell their story and, um, and participate in, in angel investing. Awesome. So Justin, um, yeah, thanks for pulling off screen share for a sec there. We've got some questions coming in and, and I do want to address these because it is, um, equity crowdfunding is, let's be clear, it is for companies that have sales, correct, already, right? They, they're already producing to some extent, or where's the threshold in this? Uh, it really depends. I think that like our sweet spot is really like 
uh, companies that are pursuing a venture path in that you, you're going from seed to series A to series B, you're looking to get to VCs and, and uh, institutional investors over the course of the business as you grow. Um, that's probably the cleanest fit on WeFunder. Um, but at the end of the day, it really comes down to like, you know, we have idea stage businesses. We have early, we have super early stage businesses that participate on WeFunder. Okay. At the end of the day, it's like, I need to raise capital. I'm going to do it with or without WeFunder. Yeah. If WeFunder helps me do it, if WeFunder makes it easier for me and helps me raise this capital faster, that's great. The difference is that to a certain point, it's pretty heavily oriented. It's like the first, call it hundred to $200,000. Um, you're generally not seeing tons of exposure and momentum and random people kind of uh, participating in the campaign. Uh, so earlier stage businesses, it's more, it's more, you know, success is more kind of like in the hands of the founder and the work that they do. And as you build that momentum over time, you'll get more and more opportunities for exposure to a broader audience. WeFunder has a lot of investors that are active on our, on our platform, uh, but generally speaking, they're looking for companies that have momentum, that have traction, that have uh, you know, that angel upside that uh, is what drives them to the platform. So, uh, you know, a lot, you know, for a lot of founders, it is self fundraising where it's like, yeah. Hey, I need to go raise this capital. We funders going to help me do it faster and easier. And maybe I'll get investors from their network. Maybe I won't, but you know, my destiny is in my hands and I have to, you know, I have to make this, make this happen with, or you know, regardless of the platform. Yeah, that makes sense. Great. We'll get into some of the economics of uh, just like any crowdfunding campaign, um, you know, what what the costs are and things of that nature. But I want to, Ginger, I'm going to jump to you because I know you've got lots of questions. Ginger is a yeah. developer, not not a web developer, but a developer of buildings, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> residential uh, apartment buildings and whatnot. So Ginger, what, what questions are coming to mind here for you? And go ahead and pull yourself off me. Hey. Sorry, I thought it was off me already. Yeah, I um I'm I'm really interested in this. I have people a lot of times that tell me, and I oh I the developing I do is apartment buildings. Um and one of the things that people tell me all the time is, oh, I'd love to invest with you. And I'm like, oh <laughs> no, <laughs> like I don't have the time for that. <laughs> like it's like, you know, you I work with institutional investors, and so, but that also comes with a price that you pay, you know what I mean? As, as far as just a lot of things um but so if i understand correctly what your company does is kind of like all of that back of house so like if you if i if i crowdfund and i bring in you know a hundred different investors at a thousand or five thousand or ten thousand they're investing in like what is the structure are they investing in like a company a deal that I have, are they coming in as individuals? Are they investing into an entity which is within that deal? Like, and are you issuing like their K-1s? Is there a kind of standard agreement that you guys provide that yeah. they're buying into that talks about exits and all that? Yeah, so technically they'd be investing in the US incorporated. Um, so whether that's an LLC or a C-Corp, it has to be an LLC or a C-Corp. Um, U.S. registered. There's certainly creativity around kind of like, hey, here's a subs subsidiary that feeds into the parent. And, you know, that that is that is not terribly uncommon. Um, you know, for real estate investing, there is a slight um, caveat in that like the funds raised can't be used to invest. They have to be used for operational purposes. It's kind of a weird uh, nuance in the law. Really? Uh, I can send you more uh, information about that. There yeah. Are other, there are other platforms uh, that are other yeah. crowdfunding platforms that are focused specifically around real estate. Um, yeah. There's a different kind of, you know, there's a different pathway for that type of investing that, uh, that does exist. Uh, it's just one that WeFunder doesn't accommodate. Um, okay. 
so we we've seen some real estate, but generally speaking, it's uh, it's probably best to look at other at other platforms for that. There was one that I uh, came in contact with yesterday. It was called Lex Markets, L E X dash markets dot co. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, but yeah, we, you know, we, you raise capital under the U.S. incorporated LLC or C Corp and you're offering shares in that corporation and uh, all the back end orchestration is, is facilitated by WeFunder uh, with LLCs. The K1s are issued, um, you know, to the lead investor. So unless there's like- dividends, To the lead investor. Yeah. There, unless there's like dividends or like, uh, you know, cash considerations happening in the moment with an LLC- uh, you right. don't have to provide K-1s. Right. Um, uh, upon a liquidation, you would have to have to do some, you know, you, there, there, there would be kind of action there. So this assumes that there aren't any, there's like no distributions. There's no, it's like, it's only, it's like it's a, you enter and then you exit. That's, that's kind the of most common with like a convertible note or a safe. Uh, you know, that's generally the that's generally the type of company that chooses to raise on a platform like WeFunder. Um, okay. There is, you know, that uh, there there are examples of that. If you were going to do distributions, I think it probably makes more sense to do it through a C corp uh, to to bypass the K ones. Okay, and I think there was a question about S corp, and you you've been saying C corp. Correct. S corps are uh, relatively unfriendly with uh, mm -hmm. equity crowdfunding. So yeah. good to know. Uh, I, I I kind of assumed it was you know all under the corporate umbrella, but you're saying no, no, well, because it, of the number of investors. Through. Is it because of the pass through with the S corp? I am not super. Um, I'm not. I I don't understand the nuance of the S corp versus C corp, but uh, I just know that. Uh, we do not work with S corps, right? Because there's okay. a pass through with the S corp. I get. I. I. I it's a know. pass through, but so LLCs are a pass through. Well, that's what I. That's why I don't understand. I think. I wonder if it's. I think S corps can only have 200 investors. It's right. Cap, it limits so the cap. If, if you are going to move through the process into to you know Series A, B, etc., then yeah, you have to be a C corp. Okay, but good. That's good to know. I didn't know that. So yeah, good. That's good question. That's not typical. Our FAQ on our website is also very robust. It's got a lot of those like granular details around like, what are the investment contracts? What is the lead investor has to sign? What are the different things? You know, what are all the different kind of like nuts and bolts? So um, it's an interesting 30 minute read. Uh, it, go, it, it does a real deep dive on both the founder side and the investor side. Awesome. Helpful. Um, cool. Let's take some other examples. Um, Crystal and Liz, I'll come to you when you're ready. Let me know. And I also want to, uh, Virginia, if you're if you're there and want to pull off mute, whoever wants to to go first. <laughs> oh, there yeah. we go. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Yeah. This yeah. has been super interesting. I think for Crystal and I, we're we're starting a business in the cannabis space. So we're wondering if you know you have experience with WeFunder on cannabis startups or if this is something that you're even willing to entertain at this point. Yeah, the, there are certain regulations from our bank around cannabis businesses. Uh, you might know right metrics that are based in San Diego. They're doing a raise right now. So um, they're a software company and their customer are uh, dispensaries. Um, so that's, that's in line with the law, but there are, it's kind of like, I think it's like, if you touch cannabis, um, mm -hmm. It's uh, it's not friendly with the banks, and you fall into the same like awkward kind of category of banks don't want to work with cannabis companies, and you know that that kind of like bleeds through to you know to to what we do because we're ho holding money in escrow through a banking partner, and they only allow us to hold money for companies that work within you know their right. their rules. Right. That makes sense. Hopefully with legislation coming soon, we'll be yeah. able to, to, yeah, raise this way. But for now, you probably suggest like a friend and family raise for a, a cannabis startup. Yeah. Cannabis, cannabis investing is tough. I do uh, kind of similar to my point earlier around real estate, where it's kind of like, hey, this is a very like defined and explicit 
kind of industry and market. Uh, I do know that there are other category uh, partners that are friendly towards cannabis. We are not. Um, I believe that there are a few out there, but there's probably not a ton of upside in it's, it's like, oh, they can provide the infrastructure for you to raise capital. They don't have a huge investor network kind of, you know, waiting for you at those platforms. Yeah, that's got it. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Liz. Super yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's still very interesting. And again, we, we, we are probably going to do a friends and family model for our first raise, but this is, yeah, we're still learning a lot. Just listening. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. You should, uh, you should connect with, uh, he was actually my roommate in college. His name's Brandon David. He has okay. a podcast called Investing in Cannabis. Uh, okay. And he's the most knowledgeable person I know about raising capital for cannabis companies. You can find him on LinkedIn. Awesome. We'll do that right now. Thanks so much. Yeah. Very cool. Okay. For that tip there, Justin. Uh, Jody, you have a question. <laughs> is, um, is it only for product based? industries or what about like a service-based industry like because i have mine legal services okay. yeah uh we have yeah what we're we're indifferent on that uh on that question i think you know for uh really you know if you go to the WeFunder website you can kind of categorize based on different industries and kind of get a feel for what other types of companies similar to yours are raising and how are they doing? What are, you know, what is the presentation of their company? What kind of engagement do they have in the Q&A? What kind of updates are they posting? So you can do a lot of due diligence with comparables, uh, you know, obviously with 266 companies that are actively fundraising, um, you, 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 get a, you get a massive range uh, there, so. Do you guys help set up the campaign or is that something that we have to do on our figure out? It's, it's self-service. Uh, we also have like consultants and friends in the industry that participate uh, in executing campaigns, running paid media, doing videos, uh, campaign construction, all that stuff. Uh, that would be a more personalized conversation as to like, right what are the kind of, what are the kind of nuances of your business? How much money are you trying to raise? How would it, you know, how would you, how would you fundraise? Does it make sense to bring on a partner? Uh, generally speaking, it's like, you know, you, you guys of, have people that will help us kind of go through those questions and figure those things yeah. out. Like, I, where, I where, where do you begin? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. I have a team. I have a team. I'd be happy to connect you to someone on our team that can like do a deep dive with you on like what are all the ins and outs of what you're working with and how might it work on WeFunder. Okay, that would be great. I can um, maybe send you an email or something to connect that with you. That's great. Okay, yeah, perfect. For sure. Great question, Virginia. I want to make sure to get to you. Virginia has um, a publication um, here in San Diego. So, Virginia, you want to talk through what your thoughts are around this? Oh, I just had, um, I just have some questions about the process. Um, Great. So, I mean, are you, Justin, are you aware of um, Trust Me Vodka? Are you, do you guys work with them or do you know anything about what's happening there? What's the name of the company? Trust Me Vodka. Trust Me? Yeah. Okay. So they're basically continuously opening up rounds. I see them opening up rounds all the time. They're taking thousands of investors um the investment starts at i think 116 or 125 dollars yeah. and they just keep going and going and going and is that i mean is that similar to what um we funder would do i mean do people keep going back for multiple rounds they take thousands and thousands of investors yeah for sure uh there's some really creative uh kind of outlets around uh you know, repeat campaigns and continuing to fish out of this pool. Um, I think the key is like showing demonstrable traction across these different raises where it's like, okay, we raised X, we did Y, we raised X, you know, we're now we're ready to raise A and we're going to do B and then C to D. And, you know, it's kind of a step ladder approach where it's like, we're going to, you know, we're going to have a defined amount that we want to raise this is how we're going to apply those investments. And then we're going to circle back and, and continue to raise on a higher valuation from a bigger community 
and really lean into kind of like, hey, this is how the business, this is like part of the growth strategy of the business. Um, probably have like, I don't know, most campaigns choose to kind of continue to double dip out of this, out of this kind of strategy. Some are better than it than others. I've had a lot of campaigns that they're just, they, it's, it's just clockwork. Every six months they come back, they're ready for their next round. And they've just like, they've, they've understood like, this is the formula. This is how it works for me. This has been reliable to date. And I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep running it back. Um, hard to do if you're not making progress on the business. It's a hard justification to say like, we need to raise another million dollars and we're going to jack our valuation up. So there needs to be a little bit of, a little bit of proof behind, uh, you know, for it to work. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the one thing that I think, and why, I, why I, I love the, I love what I do. I love my job. Um, I think one of the reasons I love it is it's really creative. It's, it, it's about marketing and branding and building community and kind of, you know, customer engagement, customer acquisition. There's a lot of like, really cool kind of like undercurrent themes behind all of these raises. Um, I think that for founders that have that kind of like sweet spot and competency around branding and marketing and community, uh, equity crowdfunding is kind of a gold mine for them. And uh, it's, not, um, it's not this like cut copy formula for every founder. Everybody's got a different, you know, like Sash, for example, um, they've struggled a little bit just because their community, like this is a totally foreign concept to them where it's just like, we're investing in what, like, can I get a handbag? You know, like I was part of their, their open Q and a, and it was just like the general kind of like savviness of their core customer was not, you know, like there was a lot of education around what is this? What are we actually doing? Like, what's a safe? I don't, you know, like this is that like a safe is where I keep my keys, you know? <laughs> um, so that was, that was kind of a tough, uh, a tough thing where it's like, you know, when I was working with Amplified Ale Works, they were just getting new investors every single day from people in San Diego, you know, like a millennial population in San Diego that could wrap their head around what was going on. And, you know, the conversion was a lot easier. So there's, there's, there's so much nuance with every single company. Like, what does that community look like? How engaged are they? Uh, what is the, what is the kind of construction of that, uh, of that stakeholder that, that you interact with on an ongoing basis? Does it align with equity crowdfunding? Like, those are all questions that you, uh, both ask yourself before going in and learn a lot when you actually go through the process. And when it clicks, uh, it becomes a very attractive pool to fish out of when it comes to like, okay, we need to keep raising capital. And this is, this is uh, a strategy that really works for us. Yeah. So I have a question about that too. I mean, I have noticed that they are building this huge street team. Everyone is participating in marketing. They're super sure. excited about the company as they get the investors. And I don't think it's my perception that investors aren't really looking at the numbers very much. They're just excited to be a part of it. Yeah. And, um, they are also giving away vodka <laughs> that goes, you know, the, the value of the vodka. So it's like, oh, you're just buying the vodka at wholesale and you're getting an investment in our company. And so that's allowed under the rules as well. Huh. For sure. Well, I, I don't know specifically about like giving away alcohol. Uh, I believe that there are rules around that. I don't know. So I don't want to speak to that legal uh, legal piece. But um, when you think about like modern times raised on a super inflated valuation, um, I think if you are like a savvy investor, you'd probably like, you know, roll your eyes at uh, at the offering. But for them, it was like, hey, we've got a really awesome brand. We've got a really awesome community. We all know Modern Times being in San Diego. They've got, you know, they, they're they they're executing better than anybody in, in San Diego. They're a growing brand. They've got a lot of, they've got a lot of kind of sexiness around what they're building. And they were able to raise a million dollars with one, with one email to their community being like, we want you to be a part of this. So, um, you know, for, for, for a vodka company, that's a consumer, a consumer brand direct to consumer, like, Hey, if we can get these guys to invest, 
they're going to be our best customers. If them investing creates additional exposure to new new investors that come in, they're going to be they're going to be customers too. So again, we I keep coming back to this like consumer facing uh, point, but it's like if you can convert existing customers into investors and new investors into customers, it very much serves uh, you know you you kill two birds with one stone. The other point I would make is like. Some, inve- you know, some investors want to just put their money behind something that they really like. It's like, I believe in this. I like this. You know, this is good for the world. I want to see this succeed. Um, they may not be looking at it from a strict number standpoint. You know, I think investors you, you, in angel groups, it's kind of like, what's your investment thesis? You know, one, one piece of my investment thesis is like, if the company's not interesting, I'm out. I don't care how good the numbers are. I don't like talking, dealing, working in boring in in a boring kind of like company. It's just not interesting to me. That's specific to me. Yeah. When I was part of the San Diego Angel Conference. We were talking to a bunch of boring companies and I was very vocal about like I think these are boring companies. Um but a lot of people in the group were like, no, we want to look at the numbers. We care about, you know, like the growth trajectory and the potential of this company is what we're looking at first and foremost. So you're going to get a healthy mix of different types of investors. And when a company comes in with a real like community message, uh, I think that valuation matters a lot less. Yeah, that's what, I mean, I've noticed that too. Investors like anyone, they, they invest on emotion. Um, but I just thought it was really interesting with the, the bot, the trust me vodka one, cause they just keep getting so many investors all the time. <laughs> sure. I don't think, and they keep changing their valuations. So I don't think they're looking carefully at that, but I just had one last quick question and that's, um, I was looking at Nicole's page. Um, and so you don't have to, I didn't see that she was stating how much she wanted to raise. Um, did I miss that? Or do you not have to disclose that? Um, it's a it's a range. Uh, generally speaking, there is not a there is not a like set target for most of these companies, um, and for most fundraising in general, it's like we're gonna raise as much as we can, and we know we don't want to raise over this much. But like how we get to this number is an open question. Maybe we'll maybe we'll cruise there through WeFunder. Maybe it'll be through external and in, investor conversations. Like. She's out pitching angels and VCs in parallel, cycling some of those to WeFunder, but there might be a a standalone investor that writes a $750,000 check that gets her to a million dollar, you know, this million dollar target. She got 750 from this one investor, 300 from WeFunder, we call it a day. Maybe she just like comes out the gates, you know, something happens, she gets some good press, she raises a million dollars on WeFunder and she doesn't need, you know, so it's like, Hey, we're we're kind of we're kind of exploring a lot of different conversations and strategies in parallel, trying to piece it together. So WeFunder is one piece of the puzzle to get to this, you know, to get to this, you know, whatever the goal might be. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I really like the way you're positioning that too, because just looking at the platform and again looking at Nicole's page and the the updates and just continually having those conversations. I could see that uh, if I was an outside investor, you know, it gives me a place to go to get updates myself too and see what her progress is and see, okay, she's raised over 300 so far to, you know, quite unsophisticated group of investors. If she can convince, you know, a housewife in Saskatchewan, Canada, who knows nothing about investing to give her $500 as an equity, you know, piece of her company, That's pretty impressive. So uh, that storytelling, you know, on the platform is, is interesting as well. Definitely. Yeah. Good. Awesome. Um, any other questions for Justin around equity crowd funding? And you do bring up a good point, Virginia, you're used to seeing that on Kickstarter, like, okay, we've reached our goal, right? And you, you have this goal and you were this close to the goal where this is a bit different. Any other questions for Justin? All right, well, um, Justin, I recorded this. I'm gonna be sharing this out on our platforms. Jody, you came off mute, any? any? Oh, I just wanna, can we get, your email or your contact information. Yeah. Yeah, do you mind yeah. dropping that in the chat, Justin? Sure. 
Awesome. And I can follow up with folks too. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Vani, you, you asked uh, some good or <laughs> made some good comments. Vani's brand, brand new in her business and she's building communities. So I think for you, um, looking at this in the future as you build the community and then when you maybe go out to do, you know, to build a plot, maybe you decide, like I have a member here in San Diego, who Vani's up in Orange County, but um, she's building a platform for teachers in the Farsi community, for example. So it, it's a platform, it's very community driven. Um, this could be, once she gets a little more traction, this could be a good platform for her to go do a raise to actually build a full scale platform as opposed to a WordPress website or something like that, you know? For sure. So definitely good to understand for for the future as you build your community, for sure. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. That's good because um, I know I want to build community around people being interested in adding new rituals into their lives. You know, it comes from ancient Indian history. It's more of reviving that and keeping it alive and bringing it to the Western world. That's yeah. the whole goal. I see it working every morning and in my head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, just, and I think, I think money, the, the good thing, what, you know, you're, you have a niche, right? You can get people excited about, you know, you're not just making a widget, you're, you're continuing culture, right? Through mm -hmm. this particular, you know, form of art. And so again, if you can build community around that and build momentum around that, then what I'm hearing Justin say is then getting people to invest in that is easier. Um, I would say too, Virginia, for you, I want to circle back here for a sec, um, if you have another moment with, with your publication, I mean, you built community around what, you, what you're doing, right? I mean, do you see this as a potentially a way to raise money through the community you've built? Um, I'm not sure for um, the magazine if I'm going yeah. to, to do it this way. Um, I have some other business things I'm working on as well. Um, and I do, I have been approached by a couple of investors asking to invest in the magazine. Mm. So um, I'm just, um, I have had businesses before where I've raised money um, first from angel investors and went through the whole process. And just managing the investors is a whole nother aspect of the business. So I'm well aware of what that takes. <laughs> and um, so I'm really taking my time and making sure that um, I do it strategically. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah. We had, um, we had, a, um, we had a campaign a couple of weeks ago launch. This is... Uh, you know, more relevant for you, Vani, is um, they were like a Tony Robbins self-help kind of community where it was like, hey, like, you know, the whole Tony Robbins spiel uh, <laughs> is a different flavor of it. And they raised like $7 million from their community very, very quickly in less wow. than a month. And it was just a byproduct of like, hey, their community had transformational impacts from their programming, hmm. you know, I, I didn't subscribe. I don't, I don't, I don't, you know, like it wasn't for me, but it was for their community. And you could see that like, you're not getting 10, 20, $50,000 checks for people in your community, unless like there's a deep impact that, that you've created. And I think that's where it's kind of like, in some elements, community is kind of a byproduct of business generally. Uh, but there's definitely, definitely different flavors of that community uh, that you see. Um, on the flip side, we worked, you know, with, uh, an organization called Wear Your Voice, um, you know, super LGBT oriented around like, hey, like female, minority, LGBT, you know, empowerment, um, didn't connect with their audience. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, they didn't, they didn't, you know, for whatever reason. Um, uh, so uh, mm -hmm. they're definitely, they're definitely like, there's a there's a range of different types of like engagement levels uh you know when it comes to you know this type of stuff yeah interesting <laughs> well it'll be fun now that we've got some context to go study the site a little bit and look at campaigns and look at what's working um really yeah. really appreciate your time justin and again we'll make this recording available to the folks that weren't able to make it and i'll share it out on our social channels as well so folks can go back and uh, watch and listen. So 
Um, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for everybody who came. Hopefully you learned something new today. I know I did. Um, and uh, we'll look forward to staying in touch. Perfect. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Have, a, have an amazing day. Thank you. You too. Take care. Bye-bye.